welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's returning guest is Uga Carlini. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I missed you. You were first on this podcast back in 2018 with your powerful documentary about the human's will to survive, Alison. And you're back with us with a new documentary called Beyond the Light Barrier. So before we go any further, and I should add, that's in Britain, that's available on Prime Video. Um, and I think it's, is it on Freebie as well? The, the, the ad supported version or is it just on Prime? I, I think so. I'm not sure because every, but um, I don't I can't speak. I think it's free. Yeah. But Alice, and you can watch Alison on Prime. Yeah. But that's not free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you want to give us a brief synopsis to what Beyond the Light Barrier is all about, please? Sure. The world's allegedly most trusted contactee story, it says <laughs> on the, lo- the log line. And it's the incredible story of a South African born woman, Elizabeth Clara, mm. who was not abducted by an alien and who was not from, because it seems to always be like people from trailer parks or that, you know, mm. not always, but when it's, you know, it's, 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 it's already sort of wishy-washy when these people say they've been taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was a meteorologist from a very affluent family. And in 1975, she got flown to Wiesbaden in Germany, where 22 of the world's greatest mind, minds quizzed her because of this incredible scientific knowledge she had, right? Mm. And lo and behold, it's a woman who had this <laughs> incredible... No! Do, do they have brains? Do, do women have brains? Surely not. Did you, did you know? I mean, <laughs> bloody hell. So um, there she goes, and she's cute with her pearls, and she does her presentation. Allegedly, she even got flown to the House of Lords in the UN, allegedly, to present. Mm-hmm. This bod and I could prove, I could prove that. Um, but there was one problem. The mo- so, if, so the scientific knowledge, so rock solid, amazing, wow, gosh, how could you know? And then she simply said, because my extraterrestrial lover, Archon, from an advanced human race, took me in his ship to his planet and showed me. So there's that, and there's also the fact that he was the lover of her life, and she allegedly had a baby with him. So there you go. It is a fantastic tale, and it's one that um, it's one that's going to make people question what it is. Because obviously, like you say, that story of a woman who can who can go and speak to some great minds and baffle them and blind them with what she knows. And there's no, I mean, there's nothing in her biography which suggests she's learned that any other way. No. So, so this the the plausible story from her side is. Archon did indeed take her to a planet and teach her about science. Alleg- yeah, science and the ultimate lovemaking, apparently, because, I mean, she even goes into great depth as to how absolutely easy everything was. And even when she had the baby, he just rubbed her leg a little bit and out popped the baby at the ripe old age of 48. <laughs> so, I mean, it just goes to show what true love can do. Now, <laughs> With such an open and shut case, this this obviously was a film that took five minutes to make, yeah? Yeah, sure. Especially <laughs> when you as a as a because this was supposed to be my first film. Okay, right? okay. So yeah, idiot me though. So here comes the first time. So, so just listen to this math. First time filmmaker with a non-fiction film about a woman who had an alien lover yeah. on another planet. And I could not understand what everyone's problem was and why they didn't want to just throw bucket loads of money at me. So, um, and I mean, I went it far, I went hot dogs, I went, you know, go big or go home or mm. go to meet on, whatever. So um, everyone wanted to see the film, but no one wanted to give me the money to make it. So bit by bit, from being the first filmmaker to win Ethereum um, in the world's first Ethereum film fund, to the National Film and Video Foundation, who then later came on board, um, uh, credit cards, debt, my my dear um, cinematographer who had the gear so we could go shoot. You know, lessons were learned while making this film. And 13 years later, well, actually during COVID, mm. a 
it was the closest, the closest I've ever come to giving up on a film. And I and and I phoned my one editor, Joe, and I said, Joe, let's just see what we have. Let's just see if we put it together. What happened? And then I started remembering all this incredible this journey, and I was like, you know what? Can we swear on the show? Can I swear? Yeah, yeah, now? yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just went fuck it. I am not giving up now. There's too many people who worked for free, mm. too many people who I owe, and the least I can do is finish this film. And Joe and I cut in, I mean, COVID, right? COVID made a lot of things happen, and a lot of good and a lot of bad things happen. But we, we put a little something together, and I started sending it out. And the tide turned. And things started falling into place. And, um, and then I, long story short, pitched it to Amazon. I remember I had 30 minutes. And the first 25 minutes I spent shitting myself about how hard it is. Like I've already made a film. It's doing so well on Amazon. What else do I need to do? Why does it always have to be so difficult? And 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 literally 25 minutes in, my incredible commissioning editor, Zach, said to me, Uga, how about you tell me about your film? And I have five minutes left. <laughs> so, and here we are. And I must say to you, it was like it was like a homecoming. I had the most incredible team work with me on this. Many of them came back. I mean, 13 years later, hey, a lot happened. Mm. Like, I have two kids. There's been divorces. There's been babies. There's been this. There's been that. Some of the, a lot of our people died. A lot of our interviewees mm. have already passed away. So it's really, for me, this wasn't just a film. Um, this was a very, very, very big chunk of my life. And also, this story has been with me since the age of eight. When I first read about it in the biggest um, family magazine in South Africa called the Ice Genoet. So, um, who, who, you, who, you, who you speak to, the you get the journalist who wrote that article into your, into yes. your documentary, don't you? Exactly. So, yeah. So, to answer your, your question in a very long way, there you go. Well, what, what's interesting there is, and and you know, I, I record I record podcasts every week, and w when I've when I'm in the interview, it's a very you know it's a very live moment, and you don't always know how good or bad what you've got is. But when you've been shooting footage and collecting archive footage over 12, 13 years, how much how much gold did you find or realize you had? You know, after you've got got over that hump of I'm going to give up. But then you start going up. What gold did you find? What was the first bits of gold you found in the stuff you had before you, as you started to pull the film together? My, so this is personal because, you know, different things resonate with different people. But mm -hmm. David Clara, her son, yeah. gave me the actual box brownie camera that Elizabeth Clara um, allegedly took the world's first ever, allegedly, um, UFO photos with, okay? Mm -hmm. And that box brownie sits here in my bookshelf. No. And it like sort of looks at me with guilt every time <laughs> I walk past and this damn film is not made, right? <laughs> so, so the box brownie and some of the original photos was given to me as a gift. Okay. And somehow I started finding it in myself to ignore that box brownie. I even packed books in front of it, right? Because it's a bookshelf. So that's easy <laughs> enough to do. And then in this process of rejuvenation, um, I went back to that bookshelf and and there was all these things that was profound to me at the time, books by authors. I mean, obviously, if you've shot for 13 years, yeah. you make a film that's an hour and a half. There's yeah. a lot of incredible um Interviews also that didn't even make the film at all, yeah, right? Of course. But so so even though this was actually one of the first pieces of archival given to me, unpacking that and rediscovering it and facing it again was actually a very pivotal moment in this process for me. And then let me just tell you this: this is not quite your question, but just because it's so damn interesting. So her son, David, who's in the film, who everyone can go meet there. I've got so much love and um, empathy for that man. He's been through a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say too much because that's all in the film and it's it's a fascinating bit, actually. But 
David phones me. So now remember, we now we've had COVID. South Africa, by the way, had the worst lockdown rules. We weren't even allowed to drink, smoke. I don't smoke, but it, suddenly I wanted to because we weren't allowed to. Not allowed to smoke, not allowed to drink, and not allowed to walk for two months. Eh? Okay. So get out, get rediscover my full, and now we're free again, right? Yeah. Then David phones me and he says, Hey, Uga, I am moving. Um, quite profoundly far away. And I've got a suitcase full of my mum's stuff that I'm going to throw away and a suitcase full of my mum's stuff that I'm going to ship. And I'm like, okay, why is there two suitcases that I don't even know about when I've been with this project since the age of eight? Because I thought I knew everything, right? I'm sort of seen as the the world leader of information on Elizabeth Clara at this point. (laughs) And I'm like, and also he lives far off. So Durban is a two hour flight where he was at the time flights for me. Um, and I was like, you know, now we need to, I'm like, I'm coming. Just, just sit on the suitcase. I'm on my way. <laughs> Arrived there and he already shipped the one suitcase. So the suitcase with his mum's stuff that he wanted to keep, I still don't know what's in there. And then he gave me this other suitcase. And in the other suitcase, amongst some of the things, is the only evidence alleged, we have of Alien Man Archon, which is the painting. And David gave me that. Oh, my I word. Have you have the painting. I'm like, yeah, the painting is in a box in my garage because it freaks me out. I feel like that. Because remember, I don't like him. <laughs> I don't think he's great at all. So now I feel like he knows it in that painting. So the box Brownie and I are friends again. But that painting, I have it. But it's in a in a big thing in my garage that can lock just yeah. in case it climbs out. Now you know, for revenge. Now, when you've been with a story since you were eight, I mean it's I mean, just to give people who are not from South Africa an idea, sure. how iconic is Elizabeth Clara in terms of the general psyche of a South Africa when if somebody says, Have you seen a UFO? Is that just going to trigger Elizabeth Clara if you're talking to a South African? For those who are into that, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, you must remember, um, I mean, everyone knows South Africa's history. Mm-hmm. So South Africa, so, so when it comes to things a little bit um, uh, weird, uh, they, can be, they can be quite judgmental. So I think, but what's in, and also it's a, it's a certain generation that remembers Elizabeth Clara very well, okay. right? Yeah. Um, but anyone skewed to the world of UFO absolutely knows about her. And it's actually not just in South Africa. I mean, she's got an iconic, it's, the book was a cult status book at one point. Right. Because also that was a nonfiction book, right? That was her biggest, just like me with this full. Yeah. Um, yeah. She was like, I will not. I will not publish this as fiction. As fiction, this is non-fiction, um, which made us. She struggled to find a publisher for a long time. Then in Germany, because of the Wiesbaden thing, she got a publisher. So the book was actually published in German, and then the world fought on, and South Africa woke up, and she got a publishing deal here and in England, and blah 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 blah. What do you think? is the enduring appeal of wanting to prove or is it believe UFOs and extraterrestrials? So that's not what I set out to do, hey? Okay, okay. I, yeah, I just want to be very clear. So I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen an alien. I sort of feel I have enough on my hands on an earth level with what's going on around me, yeah. okay? okay. So there's that, yeah. Also, I specialize as a filmmaker in female-driven heroine stories. So I like interesting females. That One of them raised me. It's all I know. Flawed and interesting females. Let's also just add that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because for me, that's what's interesting, right? Um, even Alison, in her own way, is flawed. She's flawed for being too good, actually, <laughs> if, if that's it. But... You know what I mean? Trusting, I do, yeah. giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, blah, blah, blah. So that, and also, I also want to say to you, when this story fascinated me so much, do you know what it was about the story? 
So now this is a rhetorical question because I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> so in that article, the Heisgenoot article where the story broke, mm-hmm. what, what, what was my issue wasn't the alien. It was the fact that his spaceship bl- allegedly blinded her Siamese cat. And I was like, if you are so smart and awesome and your spaceship has got so much technology, how dare you blind the cat or at least not fix the cat as a cat person myself? Mm. So that's really where my my sort of... Okay, but you, you, you as an observer, as the filmmaker, have spoken to a lot of people yes. who are keen if not just willing to believe Elizabeth's account. So what do you yeah. think, I mean, you know, when, 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 you know, if we think about proof in terms of what we see in the film, we've got a hologram on a photograph, which, you know, if I'm honest, could look like a bit of a light blemish, not a hologram. If you're being, you know, if I'm being, if I was being cruel to Elizabeth and doubting her, uh, the evidence of her eyes versus my eyes, but you know, nevertheless, people, I wouldn't buy it. So from your experience of speaking to these people that that have got an interest in it and want to, what do you think is the enduring power of it all that keeps... I mean, so I'm asking that question, and as, as I say it, I'm going, we've got umpteen religions that seem to survive on nothing much really beyond the power to believe. I, I'm not discounting that the possibility of life out there exists. Nor am I. I just... Yeah. I just hope it's not Archon because there's another <laughs> asshole to deal with. So, so that's where I stand up. Okay? And I feel we've got enough assholes as it is that yeah. we need to navigate. Okay. Yeah. So what being said, I think, I mean, I, I myself as a storyteller, the magical realism has got my attention. If you can look at my list of things there that we're going to discuss just now, it's, magical realism driven yeah. often. I think the idea that there's something out there that we cannot necessarily explain and it can be nice. It's an it's an escape. It's it's something else to hold on to that that you don't have all the answers for that's refreshing or an escapism or a, the same way we watch a film to switch off mm. or the same way you go for a walk in the mountains or whatever you do. Yeah. Um, I just think sometimes the unexplained or the things that we, it's it's a possibility of perfect that exists and that gives people hope. Because remember, the original story here specifically goes, this is before we unpack the lost act, Mm. please, everybody. With that being said, allegedly, originally, this is the perfect race where there's no fighting, they don't die, they don't age. You eat a plant and that's your contraceptive. Um, you, you, the water coming out of your tap is so mineralized, you're just fucking perfect, like whatever. It's heaven or Mecca or whatever we think is pain-free mm. and appointment-free. I mean, isn't that a nice thought? Like there are days where I go, I wish that planet was somewhere else for today. I still don't want it to be there because I you know, like this guy. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's a nice thought that there's a place or an ide- ideology where life is as we would like it with our disappointments and pain. And as we say in Afrikaans here, kakenare, which means shit in air and just translates horribly. It's better in Afrikaans. But, you, you know it what translates I mean? as what? Sorry, it translates as cock in order is shit in air. And that's stupid. That sounds horrible. But in Afrikaans, it works. Okay. <laughs> now, in in sci-fi, not not your not not the alleged story that, that Elizabeth has has told. Often, there's there's a kind of dystopia to our interactions with with aliens or. All this, all these things like James Blish's a case for con- case of conscience, where the idea of the sort of human supremacy goes out to the other world, and tries to colonize other other planets, and finds out that they've got perfectly civil, no wars and nothing, but they've never had religion. 
and they brought a priest with them and they can't quite understand why why a race of beings can survive without religion, which is obviously an arrogance of the humans, even though that the humans invented it, to my mind, but that's a whole other thing. But what Elizabeth is doing is kind of creating this kind of utopia out of her. There's no there's no fear, there's no threat to it in her mind. Obviously, what what John Dr. John Canney goes on to say as a narrator is all sort of recontextualizes it both as her story, but also as a story overlaid over the second half of the 20th century in South Africa as well, doesn't it really? I think it's safe to say. Um, so I think that's just a statement rather than a question. Um, so what does that make me ask? Um, so yeah, Dr. 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 John Canny as a narrator. Now you say you do, fil- you, you do films about interesting for females, but your narrator is a, is a male voice. So what was what was the choice there? What what were you what were you thinking with that that creative decision for the film? So um, there's a few answers to that question actually. So firstly, for me, um, when it comes to race in South Africa, yeah. because of our history, yeah, I had to be very very careful, and at the same time, I had to deal with this. And Nelson, so Nelson Mandela is dead. Desmond Tutu is dead, and. John Carney for me is in that I, I, I put him in that same um, group of people because mm. of life experience, because of wisdom, because of what he went through. Um, yeah, at one point, I mean, he's blind in his one eye because the apartheid police beat him so much when he went to America to go and collect the Tony Award that he won. That when he came back here with the Tony Award. Um, that they beat him, they almost killed him, and he's to this day blind in his one eye. Um, so he's been through a lot, mm. and he's always used theatre for radical change and to do the work. So I, I could not speak to that as a white South African. Um, I felt it wasn't my place, and I felt I actually, I, you know what I mean? It, it needed to be someone that... I can trust and that I look up to and that that that's got the wisdom. Mm-hmm. Plus, John Carney is very much known for Black Panther and for um, Captain America, which is sci-fi film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, I used to write exams about this guy when I was a drama student. <laughs> so it's always been my dream to work with him. And he was going to be in my film, Angelina, uh, my previous film, my fiction, and then COVID happened and John couldn't travel. Okay. Um, it, you know, he was high risk. Um, so, so, and I mean, and, and then I thought, okay, well, John, you are going to do this film with me then. And I just pray to God to say yes, because the, my fear was, I because sh- he got how it worked. Um, he got the rough cut, mm-hmm. you know, without any of the manipulation. And um, he got the rough cut a week before we um, filmed with him. We had one day with him. The morning I recorded the voiceovers. Yeah. And the afternoon we recorded the, the, the question. And I asked him one question. And the question was, John, what do you make of all of this? And I don't know if you people know about our load shedding in South Africa, where they cut our power two to three times a day. If you're lucky, it can be more. Um, and it was load shedding at six o'clock that afternoon, and which meant our generators couldn't run the theatre lights. We shot him in a theatre. Right. And um, and we had we had 48 minutes before load shedding. And literally, he spoke for 48 minutes. I asked him that one question. Load shedding happened. All the lights were cut and it was pitch black dark in the theatre. And we literally stood there for two minutes in the dark until someone thought to go, oh, lights, and switched... Um, one of the the battery operated lights on. It was so profound. Um, and again, what you see in the in the in the film is five minutes of a forty eight minute life changing event. So that's why it had to be John Carney. Um, and also, just because I specialize in female driven hero and stories, I don't exclude anyone else. That's hmm. that's the whole point. Um, you know, a bit of man every now and again is not a bad thing. And um, that's what John Carney was there for. 
No, no, and, um, and, and it's and it's an important part of your story. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's even wilder now. You've told me that how you how you made that segment of it because we have the voice which is not synced with him. He's he's, he's very present as an image, a recurring image throughout <laughs> throughout the film. But then in the final act, when we get to the punch of what he's what he's saying, I won't spoil it for people who, who haven't seen it yet. Um, that's when we get we see the performance of him, which, like you say, is maybe five minutes, only five minutes. But his voice is throughout, is isn't it? It's it's yes, yeah, he's it, the voiceover. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's, he's both, oh, sorry, guys. What one one um, one last question about the film for me? And um, given that you've been in, you've been interested in the story since you were eight, and you've made a film for thirteen years, so you're at least over twenty one now, aren't you? Um, I am. <laughs> I know it's hard to tell, but <laughs> so having gone through the oh, pro- hundred, <laughs> <laughs> having gone through the process of pulling the film together, um, what for you? What what from a perception you had of the story before making the movie? And now having made the movie, what do, what's the biggest shift in your perception of this oh, story? Based on you know, if you think of what the one of the kid of you that's evolved in you as you become an adult, now as a filmmaker, you've really put it under a microscope, haven't you? So, in what sense, in what sense have been the biggest shifts in your perception about this story? That's a very very good question, and I'm going to answer it for you with the title changes, this format, because that ex- that answers you. Okay, go so on. when. I call this the, this is like like a love, uh, like a, a toxic relationship. It all starts so well, the honeymoon phase, right? Mm. All the potential is there. So therefore, the film was also called The Incredible Lightness of Being. I mean, I was smitten. It was honeymoon. <laughs> She's the best. Everything is awesome. Maybe he's not that much of an asshole. L- let's get into it, okay? Mm-hmm. Then I start unpacking. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is really an environmental film because now I'm starting to find lies and this guy sucks. And I'm like, okay, so how can we redeem this? We can redeem it because she is an environmentalist. And I still, to this day, stand by the fact, for me, this is an environmental film. And she chose one hell of a way to get our attention. Um, To, you know rather than speaking to the already converted than that maybe an Al Gore film would do. And yeah, he won the Oscar. I'm not dissing anything. Uh-huh. It's just it speaks generally already to those of us who are pro-environment. That's not where the change needs to happen. The change needs to happen with the masses. And how better to get the attention of the masses than to say, hi, I went to meet on, had sex with an alien and I had a baby. You know, I sort of would go, oh, okay, I'm listening. Do you know what I mean? I if do. If the Kardashians have a cool show and all of that, you know, this is how you do it. Again, no, I mean, Kardashians are incredible businesswomen, but you know what I mean? I do, yes. Like, in comparison to me, that takes 13 fucking years to make a film, okay? And many others, have, I mean, I know even James Cameron, I think Titanic took 20 years or something like that. Anyway, maybe that's a, it's a lie, but that's what someone once told me. So... So then it became good planets are hard to find, okay? Because the le- good planets are hard to find. And that was also like a logo of hers. Mm-hmm. And then and then when I, much, much later in the journey, because I was working off the new book, the, 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 the soft cover, mm-hmm. where they removed the detrimental paragraph, okay? So I had no idea. Uh, then okay. my mom, yeah, yeah. Then my mom, who had the book originally that had those paragraphs in and of course, like any good old South African of those days seemed to not have an issue, like just the alien sort of took the lead in it all. I told her, hey, mom, that hardcover book I saw on eBay for $1,000. So my mom goes and finds her book that she loaned or some cousin or someone had the book, okay? My mom's always in the market for a buck. So $1,000 in rand is a lot. Goes and gets the book from Tani Marta, Auntie Marta, and um, and then at the time, this was the project that my husband at the time hated the most. He hated this story, also because I bankrupted us in the process with credit cards <laughs> trying to get this format. So in his defense, I get it, but whatever. So then I said to him, listen, if you hate this story so much, at least read the book so that you can see the potential of the story. You know what I mean? Like... It's about the potential. 
and he took the hardcover and read it on the train to work and came back, blessed him the one night from work and he said to me, he can't believe I, I've taken on this story knowing like that there's blatant racism in the book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you fucking talking about? Because at that point, I can recite the book. Right. We, we, that was about eight years in, nine years in. And, and that's how I found out that between the original hard, hard, um, not hard, what do you call it? Hardback. It's like, the, yes. And the new, new age edition, which I had. Yeah, the paperback. They literally, yeah, they removed, they removed these paragraphs. And there was no, there was no, there was no forward to say, because it's the 21st century ever, we've decided that this is, this isn't needed in the story or whatever. Nope. Wow. Nope. And I'll tell you another really fascinating story because that for me was, that was a big one. And when this happened, I thought back to that and that's when I realized there's big shit here. Yeah. Um, in my, in 2010, when I, when I optioned to make this film, that's when the journey started. Yeah. Um, I was very green. Like, this is my first film. Remember, I'm walking around thinking it's going to be easy to make. And I, I just said yes to all interviews. Anyone they wanted to speak, because then the news broke, the film's coming. <laughs> and I spoke to everyone. I would I would get up two in the morning, because of course we're in South Africa, so no one's time is ever aligning with ours. Every UFO group, every UFO radio station, I'm there. And then the one night, it was this radio station somewhere in the Midwest American. The guys had cowboy hats. And I mean, hello, if you watched Yellowstone, <laughs> I love cowboys now. Um <laughs> I am like, yes, like, yes, these cowboys, and they've got the accent, and it's just so cool, and and it's, we're talking aliens, and it's just an awesome conversation, and suddenly, out of nowhere, it turns, and the guy says to me, how was it growing up in a, in a terrorist South Africa? And I'm like, I'm not quite understanding the question now, because technically, I grew up halfway in apartheid South Africa. And then in my high school, it changed, right? Yeah. And what is he now saying? Because now I'm just confused. Because, I mean, one second ago, we were talking about spaceships. And then I realized that this guy is a far, 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 far right kind of person. And they were using the Elizabeth Clara book as a manifesto. No. Because of that. Wow. And I was so confused. And so upset, I just said, I'm done. Um, I, I, I contacted my lawyer in the States. I was, I was horrified by, by the experience. Mm. That was the first very big lesson, but I still couldn't understand why. And then when this paragraph thing started happening, it changed everything. And that's when I realized that like any, you know, anything that's over the top, they will find whatever they need to back their angle. Yeah. And that that part in that book is used by many unpleasant ones for their agendas. The same way some people say women shouldn't cut their hair and wear bloody pants. Yeah. Because it says on the Bible. Yeah. Or whatever. And don't eat shrimp. Basically. I mean, I don't really eat shrimp, by the way, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't need seafood because I'm a mermaid, but <laughs> yeah, but exactly. So that for me, yes, like, that, like I've learned some tough lessons with this project. So that, so in a way, that discovery and that experience, and that coupled with that experience, was was like a sort of a a reawakening for you of what you were doing, as much as it was a fascinating. Yes. And, and then to go back to your question, mm -hmm. so remember, so we went incredible lightness of being yep. honeymoon phase. Yeah. Sort of the boring part of the marriage now, good planets are hard to find, you know, straight yeah, yeah, and narrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I went, okay, divorce is upon us. It's going to, we're going to go back to our roots. We're going to call a spade a spade and it's going to be beyond the light barrier. Full stop. Mm. That's the name of this film. Admittedly, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't as familiar with who John Canny is as, as, as maybe some viewers will be, but, you know, I was just listening to him narrate the film and obviously coupled with the interviews, I wasn't seeing 
the politics with the big P coming at the end of the film. I was, I was, I was a bit, you know, your film does a good trick on the audience in a way because you've got these kind of quaint, normal people. They're not, like you say, they're not swivel eyed lunatics who, mm. who were, who were going, I saw, I saw an alien spaceship and I, I, yeah, no, and I had, people. I'd had seven bottles of moonshine and I was upside down behind the telly when it happened. You know, it's not nothing yeah. like that. It's very much people no. being deadpan serious talking about it like they talk about doing a tax return, which is quite interesting. I mean, yeah. and I also that, the, the, the candor of the film is also very interesting in that sense because even the people that are cynical are not angry or or or, oh, or, or yeah. appalled by the fact that somebody might believe in it. They just go, well, you know, from my point of view, there's just, I mean, the sun's sort of skewered in the middle, isn't he? He's kind of, <laughs> he's kind of, it's his mum. He has to sort of go along with some of what, you know, this idea is one can't be whole crazy, but... Yeah, and he loves them. I yeah, mean, and he, he loves her, and, and there just isn't yeah. enough there, yeah. there just isn't enough for him to go, yes, definitely. I mean, f- th- there's also humour in there, if you kind of, if you look at it from, yes. a, from a rationalist point of view. When you've got that's people it. saying, I've got an alien cousin, you're like, wow, that's that, that's levels of belief I just couldn't begin to have. But, you know, I look, at, I look in their eyes as they're saying it, and they don't, they're not embarrassed by it. They're just like, what a oh. nice, what a nice thought. <laughs> yes, and and I mean, there's something <coughs> to see for me in in the people. I mean, I care deeply, and I, I mean, it's like that with all my films, mm. even with fiction. Like when it's all over, I feel like I'm going through a breakup. I can't believe that everyone's just going on with their lives, and I'm now going into post. I'm going to be looking at them all every day, mm. and and I think for me the the, the a lot of these people spoke for the first and the last time on camera to me about it, and they trusted me completely. And yeah. and they are just so lovely. Like like you say, even the greatest skeptics, they are just awesome people, and they just tell you how it is and and how they how they see it, Indeed. and it's lovely. Well, look, and you're sorry. I was just going to. Well, you finish your thought. Oh, um, I was going to say. The reason why, because some people have criticized me for throwing that curveball at the end. Mm. But I'll tell you something. We did a cut where that was at the beginning. And you can't go on once you've been dealt that card. Yeah. Because it's it's so fucked up that the, the it just it just it just wipes everything else out the door. Exactly. So it had to be at the end, and it, and and yet, Carney, without giving it away, he leaves us with so much love. No, he does, and, and but but also you you, in, in sort of screenwriting terms, because Khan is there from the his voice is there from the start, even if the the truth about the book that we don't quite know until you reveal it, isn't till that moment in the in the final act of the movie, but it's you've set it up, you've 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 give us his uh-huh. voice, you've give us his. He's the author of what we're really meant to believe at the end. The other people are the detail and the context about why, in a way, why he's talking, if that if that makes sense. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure it, it was designed that almost, way, but that's kind of how yeah. I saw it. Absolutely. And Carney is basically the filmmaker that takes you on the journey mm. and unpacks the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. But instead of leaving you with a fucking broken heart, he heals it right at the end, like only he can. And, I mean, that's unrehearsed, unscripted, carny talking from the heart. Blows my mind. Now, you've told me that process. The idea that what I watched is actually a one-take wonder, that's friggin' amazing. Absolutely. Except the voiceovers. Obviously, the voiceovers yeah. were written and read. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that's the beginning. But when Carney looks at you and he looks yeah. you in your eye and yeah, he yeah. starts talking, that's the camera rolling. Fantastic. One time. At 48 minutes. Well, congratulations for Beyond the Light Barrier. It is readily Thank available you. on Amazon Prime or Prime Video in Britain and other places. And yes. we are going to move into three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. And then yes. and looking at the titles, there may be there may be links back to this film, or at least <laughs> there, there, there may be a, there may be DNA in a bloodline somewhere. Um, in Little terms of... did I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just so for those that have joined the show to listen to you and have not heard this before, then what we're going to do is you've given me three films 
And, well, you've given me more than three films, but the rules are three. We're going we're gonna to discuss three films with you discussing oh. slightly. You'll discuss more, but I'll be prompting you with, with three moments. And then for five minutes, you'll be chatting with me. And then at the end of that five minutes, you're going to hear this sound. And you can hear that okay at your end. I can hear it. Brilliant. And when that sounds, that's that's the end of five minutes. So we move on to the next film. I'm not, this isn't strict. You don't have to stop talking the minute you hear that sound. I mean, finish your thought and stuff. First first off the bat, we have got E.T., The Extraterrestrial from 1982, directed by the one, the only, Steven Spielberg. Would you like to tell us a little bit as to why you that film had such an impact on you, where you first saw it, how you saw it? Right. I am at primary school. I am with my mother and my sister, who's six years younger. I don't know why I have to say she's six years younger. I'm under pressure now because I have five minutes. And we go. It's old school. South Africa is sanctioned because of our horrid politics. So there's only a few films that get let into the country. And E.T. is one of them. My mom puts us in a little car. We drive all the way to our closest cinema, which is Sunlum Center there in some place there close to our house. And we arrive there and the queue is so long. It goes out the door and two people from the booth, she goes, sorry, sold out. (gasps) Three, I know, can heartbroken. Three times we go back there Third time lucky. We the last people. We got the last three tickets, and we went into that cinema and we watched ET. And I looked at this little alien and I thought, "Fucking hell, I want to do that." And then my sister, this is the almost the most important part, was petrified of this little alien. And I was like, "Fuck yeah!" In that same heist genoet that of that um. Family magazine, yeah. in the middle of the high school, it was a poster. Every week it came out, every week, and there would be a poster of a famous person or whatever, and the one week it was E.T. And because my sister was so shit scared of E.T., I put the poster on my door and my sister wouldn't come into my room. And I was like, yes, I got her out of my room for months. <laughs> Thank you, E.T., Okay, that's five. That's not even five. Is that five minutes? I feel like that's my story for E.T. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not five minutes yet at all. No, um, I'm fascinated by what you just said there about films being, oh, you know, sanctioned by the government and only so. Not the government. Well, yes, the government sanctioned films, but the world also sanctioned us. Oh, I so, see. Sorry. Oh, got you. I see you saying. Yeah. yeah. But the, the government also sanctioned, make no mistake. The government didn't want to put Cosby show on television because they didn't want white people to see that black families are just like them. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That, it went both ways. So how, so yeah. what made what made E.T. an exception then in terms of the, 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 the blockade of films coming into South Africa? I'm not sure. I'm not, that I can't speak to because I was very small, but... Yeah. Uh, all I know is um, E.T. was one of the films that got in and we could watch it. And that idea of, I mean, I love I love the idea of queuing for a cinema. It's such a, I'm paying, oh. I'm paying. Because obviously now we just buy them on the websites, don't we? And we, we arrive know. and we show that our was, QR code and walk that, in. And also that that absolute, that heartache of you almost there. You, mm. just, you can feel it, you can smell it. And she's like, ah, sorry, sold out. And I mean, bless my mom for going back and back and back. I was so shit scared my mom was going to go fuck this. Um, cause, because, I, you know, I, I might be the one actually now with my kids. She's like, oh, my God. Um, but my mom went back. She went back three times. And my mom, I know it's not on my list, but it is up there. But my mom also snuck me in, dirty dancing. I was 13. No, I was 12. And it was 2 to 13. And my mom said, Come, let's go. And that's also like that. That I mean, Dirty Dancing wasn't on my list, but it's part of that magic. The magic that inspired me to be the filmmaker of what happens when a room goes dark and the people on the screen can hold your attention and make all us just all of us go on a journey for an hour and a half. Yeah. I mean I mean what what do you remember being 
the the power of ET then for you, apart from scaring your sister. What was what was it about the film for you? What what captured your imagination so much? Oh, just that like whoever designed ET, I just I wanted him so badly. It's just like and and little Drew Barrymore. I mean. <sighs> Everything about it and his little finger and that he just wants to go home. I mean, I couldn't deal with it. I cried to the point where it was embarrassing for everyone with me, with with us. And and it was just sure. I, you know what? When I was when I was seven, our gardener said to me that he knew he knew the seven dwarfs. <laughs> and I was like, no. And he said to me that he'd bring them for me. And I made, oh shit, I made seven beds and I waited for that fucker to bring me the seven dwarfs and he never did. <laughs> so then E.T. was given to me and there was just something to hold on to because the seven dwarfs never came. Brilliant. Well, thank you. That's a wonderful tale around E.T. Just to add to that, actually, E.T. is the first film I remember coinciding with friends that, because obviously we didn't have the same problem of, of, of um, people not selling us stuff. Um, but there was the old, there was, in, in, a, in a more traditional sense, there was the old cinematic window in the sense of something showed in America and then you waited yeah. six months to 12 months before you saw it in the UK. There wasn't like, like now where everything opens up in the world like that. Yeah. Um, so friends had been on holiday to America or Canada or wherever and they'd seen it and they're talking about this film this film that oh, you wow. cannot access. And it's like, they've oh. seen the greatest film ever. And obviously, every film gets better the less the less chance you've got to see it. Of course. By the time you see it, your life can, you can never be the same again. <laughs> exactly. Right then. Moving on to your second choice, which is two choices. Same yes. colour. <laughs> same colour, yes. but two choices. We've yes. got uh, Luc Besson's Le Grand Bleu, The Big Blue. And we've got Jean Jacques Benet's uh, Betty Blue, but I don't. But it's not called Betty Blue. Literally translated for the French title, it's thirty-seven something or other, thirty degrees, thirty-seven degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. I think it is. I saw the French one with subtitles. Yeah, no, that's the always... that's the film. That's the film. But the French title yeah. is not a, is not a French d- derivation of Betty Blue. Oh, yes, I, yes. I only know this because I interviewed a French woman recently on the podcast who also chose Betty Blue. And for years, she didn't even know that Betty Blue was the same film. Oh, really? Yes. No, I did. So, I so why it. these? T- why put these two together? One's 1986, one's 1988. They're very different yeah. movies in a sense, but obviously they've got blue in the title. That's about the only similarities I can tell you. I'm French. And, and, but I saw them in the same year. Okay. And I was, a, I was studying. I was a student. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I, I I had a DVD player and a TV. And my best friend at the time, Nikki, um, Nikki would come every Sunday and we would just watch movies. We would lie in bed and she would come over and, and I had this big bed and we would just lie there. And then every Sunday, other people would join and we would just watch these movies, two or three of them twice. And it was, it was, I don't. I mean, this is a while while ago, hmm. but that one Sunday it was Betty Blue, Big Blue, and in fact, remember three colors: blue, white, and red. I do. Yes. Yeah. I mean, ideally, really, that should be in that second position as well <laughs> because it it it's just it's something about. Obviously, I'm Italian. My, I mean, I'm South African born, but my father is fully Italian. So, Big Blue, of course, has got the Italian resonance which just feeds my spaghetti side <laughs> and Betty Blue is the French the filmmaking it's just they had to go together because we watched them together as students yeah and I was profoundly moved by the filmmaking by how every time we paused it would be like a postcard it was so beautifully filmed so beautifully designed I mean now I know all the terms now I know what they've done. But it was it's that simplicity of French filmmaking where there's a lot of space on the frame. And I think visually I was I was profoundly moved by the the way they tell stories. 
and how beautiful everything is. I mean, Betty Blue at her worst is beautiful with that mouth mm. and the, the, the costume designer, what she made her wear and um, this, how all these elements are storytellers. I mean, that profoundly affected me as a filmmaker as well. I mean, all the films on my list is, is actually as a filmmaker, which very much um, sort of shaped me. And also when I was, okay, now we're going back to school again, but my mom was a single parent and okay. holidays, we didn't go away. We, we had to, I had to stay home and I had to look after my sister, but my mom got us a DVD account and every day we could walk down to the DVD shop and I could choose one and my sister could choose one. And then you watch that, you watch those, that one film all day long to go back to the DVD shop and return. And between that and, and the Betty Blue moment, I think that's why Sundays was so important to me because it almost took me back to, you know, Quentin Tarantino always said he, you know, he worked in a DVD shop. Yeah. Well, I walked to a DVD shop and got a DVD a day. And then had to watch it all day long. And I mean, my poor sister, she was four when she watched Rosemary's Baby. Because <laughs> it was like, come, let's discuss. So <laughs> she always says I fucked her up for life. <laughs> With, I mean, I would watch her little, I don't know, My Little Pony. But then we had to watch my film and unpack it and discuss it. So Talk us, know, tell us about your DVD shop where you're renting your DVDs oh, from. It was awesome. It was about two blocks from my mum's house. Right. And back then it was still fine to walk and kids to walk on their own. And and the guy, you know, there were always these really cool guys that worked there and or girls, like super funky. Everyone was, it was like a proper, like how you see the American movies, these real oh well, have you watched um yeah um yellow uh, not yellow jackets, yes. Have you watched yellow jackets? I've not, no. But in Yellow Jackets, Finish your thought. In, in the last season, hmm. um, in the last season, there is the one character has a DVD shop. And that is the DVD. And, and she's basically reliving her youth. Yeah. That's how we did it. And you would have discussion. And you would, you would, you know, you would have your favorite DVD shop person who you resonated with, or was maybe even a bit cute. You know, there was just a lot of reasons to go to the DVD shop back in my day. I mean, there's a lot of parallels with with the, with the record shop, isn't there? You know, it's like the the yes, yes, it's exactly that. We just didn't have a record shop, or oh, that would have also been on the list. Because because I think that what you're talking about there, especially that idea of resonating with a certain person, with one person that works in the store, so you could go, they know to say to you, "Have you seen this, this, or this?" Because they're the new arrivals or whatever. Which is to me, to my and, mind, a much more interesting way to discover films than, and because I mean, right now I can discover a film because Netflix is saying you've watched this, have you seen that? Which is kind of cute, but it's not the same relation. I don't have a relationship with Netflix that I have with the person I used to chat with, and sometimes maybe even try and impress with yeah. my selection. Exactly. It almost became a bit of a like a competition, even, you know. Have you seen? Oh no, well, have you seen? <laughs> I mean, it became like a ping pong. Game. And in fact, on that, I actually read an article last week that in the UK, that's what I read. So I'm just saying what I read. Go on. They actually bringing back human tellers because people people don't want to use the automated machines anymore. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They are yeah. missing human interaction. And I think I think that it's connection. Yeah. It's village it's i mean if we go back to the prehistoric times you know we had all these women who would help us and guide us and for the men men that's all gone now and i think really, yeah they, they, they tried it they tried when i go and get my blood test at the hospital they tried just to put an ipad out and all they ended up doing was needing a nurse to be there or a doctor to be there to help you because it's part of arriving into hospital you don't go <laughs> Don't go to hospital and just tap on an iPad and sit on a plastic chair so someone calls your name. It's such a weird way to yeah. enter a room. Um, yeah, and and it's almost like we need the connection more than ever, and it's 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 disappearing by the second. And I think that DVD shop was was a that DVD shop, of course, doesn't exist anymore. But that was one of the last villages. 
What? What? Do you remember the name of your video shop? Um. Hmm. Maybe my sister might. I'll ask her. I, I don't remember. Okay. Well, look. Let's jump on to your final choice. Yeah. Five minutes accounting. Amelie from two thousand and one, Jean Pierre Jeunet's okay. film. Do you want? Mm. I mean, this is one of not of your list. This is one I've not seen. It's it's one of my criminal, one of my not watched films. So, tell me, tell me what, what tell me why, what you, when you saw it, how you saw it, and, and why, why it's important. I should probably see it. Okay, but again, often when you see a film, it's when you see the film. Mm. If I have to see Amelie now, I won't feel the same. Okay, but when I saw Amelie, when I saw Amelie, yeah, which I think I was in my twenties. The, um, I, I was still almost a little bit like Amelie. I I believe that um, Amelie Amelie sees things very simple. I mean, I, I don't want to give too much away, but something. To, I mean, it opens because Amelie's also funny. It's sort of dark comedy, right? Yeah. Um, and it's a beautiful love story, and she's quirky. And I mean, remember, I was a drama student. Drama students were always weird, right? We were the ones that we dress weird, and and they're the weird ones. Um, and when I was at school, I was the art student. Then I was the weird one. Oh, and oh my God, I was in an African school and my surname was Carlini. So I was very strange to them. <laughs> um, and, and, and Amelie was made and I felt, oh, there's a home away from home. Look how quirky people do beautiful things. And of course, travel. Travel features so beautifully in that, in that film. And what Amelie did for me she made my imagination travel. It, it really felt to me like, I yes, I watched that movie, I think, a million times. Um, but it was, it was the timing of that film that was profound to me. And when I made Angelina, interestingly enough, mm. my fiction, I kept quoting Amelie and I kept saying, Angelina is my Amelie. Angelina is Africa's aunt, uh, my aunt, my personal speaking for myself, Africa's answer to Amelie. Um, but Angelina style, Cape Town style, Africa style. Um, yeah, so Angelina for me, uh, Angelina, Amelie for me was more about, because everything is so quirky and offbeat and, and cute. It, it's, just lovely. I mean, sex education for some bizarre reason also reminds me of Amelie, some of the characters. Um, I think Amelie also for me was one of the first films for me from what I watched up to that point to really push boundaries of storytelling and characters and putting what's really in your head like a dream world onto film and making it feel like every day. And really can you give an example? That. Can you give an example of maybe a scene where that's achieved really well in in Amelie? Yes, and and I, I still want to know from the creators of Sex Education if what the last scene in the last the one scene in the last season was inspired by Amelie, um, the gnome, the gnome that travels, and then so I don't want to give too much away, especially because you haven't seen it. But then the gnome travels, yeah, and sends a postcard every time the gnome is somewhere cool in the world, mm. like the I. Our, the gnome, like God a gnome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Statue. There, there's the statue, there's the statue, and the postcard gets sent out. See, I don't want to say it because then I'm going to give the film away. I really need you to watch it. Well, okay. Tell me, tell me then what's the most direct influence on your film, Angelina, that comes from Amelie? The, the, okay. I can't even say the colors because Amelie's palette is completely different. Mm hmm. Well, there's a gnome for one. <laughs> Is there really? Yeah, go find my gnome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. And Amelie and um, ah, Angelina also travels. And there's also the postcards at the end. Have you watched Angelina? No, I've not. No, not yet. No. Okay. So, so that one you also have to watch. Actually, please watch Angelina before Amelie, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> and then watch Amelie. Okay, the thing has gone, but I feel like. Can we just squeeze my bonus film in real quick? We we can we'll love to we'll have time to we, we can do yeah. So your bonus film is Love Actually. Why? Why? I've seen that oh, and I wish goodness. I hadn't, but go on, why? Oh, I think it feeds into every 
corny, cliche part of me, which is very strong. Mm. Like the Mariah Carey song, All I Want for Christmas. I will fall for it every year. I will sing it for my kids every year. They hate it every time. I want to cry when I hear it. When Finish when, your thought. Um, Finish your thought. Go on. You, the, the, way that, the way that film opens at the airport. I love ensemble casting, Angelina, ensemble casting. I love to make films like that, although my next films are not going to be like that at all. Oh, but I just love the. I lived in the UK for four years and it makes me homesick every time, well, homesick for the UK every time I watch Love Actually. And I can, it's one of the few films that I can watch once a year and love it every time as much. Really? Yes. I love it. I love it. The guy standing by the door with his boards. Oh my word! Die, die inside. Love it. Well, look. Come stand on my door with some boards, please. Like so cute. Well, look. Thank you very much for sharing your five films uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that have impacted everything in adult life. But thank you very much also for t- coming to talk about your, your new film, Beyond the Light Barrier, which is available to watch on Prime Video. And it just gives me to say thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for watching and thank you for having me.